title of my talk today is about data haves and have-nots. And I want to start off by just making sure we're on the same page and talk about something that we at the Signal Program on Human Security and Technology at the Harvard Humanitarian Initiative called Data Equity. And what data equity is in our experience, just to give you one case study, is when we were doing the Satellite Sentinel project over Sudan, we used $16 million of donated high resolution US spy grade imagery to do that project. That was $16 million from Digital Globe. And the data equity issue is that how do we make decisions about such costly assets like satellite imagery, about which conflict, which disaster gets to have access to $16 million of proactive tasking of a satellite? And I don't know if you know about satellites. It's not easy to tell a satellite to break out of its orbit and go somewhere. So if you've ever seen Patriot Games, you know that line where James Earl Jones says, Jack, it's not easy to retask a satellite. Well, that's what we did over and over again, okay? So, um, and, and the issue with that is we had the unique platform of having George Clooney um, supporting us. And that allowed us to have access to that data, but for people in conflicts like Central African Republic, like Syria, um, where they do not have a George Clooney and they do not have a Harvard University, um, how do we ensure that they have the same data as another population? And this is not just about satellites. Satellites is a really extreme example. Um, this happens all the time in terms of natural disasters. It happens all the time in terms of man-made small disasters. Um, when I was uh, back in 2005, I was on the ground in Biloxi, Mississippi with Oxfam as part of the response to Katrina. And I was in primarily the African-American community um, down on Division Street, um, which was one of the hardest hit. And it's 72 hours, almost four or five days after the disaster, and there hasn't been anyone from National Guard down in the hardest hit area. Well, meanwhile, we went over to the primarily white community and we saw all sorts of responders and generators. And what we realized is that there was a digitally invisible population emerging. And this is you know, almost 10 years ago. And basically, these people did not have cell phones. They were not connected to the grid. They did not know who to call and those responding didn't know how to call them. So we're dealing now with a world that's so wired that we have folks like George Clooney or folks like a Google or a Facebook can move data assets, right, based on charity, based on doing good things in the world, but not based on any science of need, not based on any science of requirements on the ground, and then we're also dealing with this digital invisibility, with populations that if, if they are not connected, they are not detected. And if they're not detected, they're not counted. And if they're not counted, they're not assisted. And if they're not assisted, then you have a situation where your actual relationship to the internet may affect survivability in disaster. So this, this isn't just, things haven't just changed because of the internet. The internet has changed the very nature of equity <laughs> because access to data and access to connection is now a preceding requirement to get access to markets, a preceding requirement to get access to key resources for sustaining life in some cases. So this is not just about disasters. Right now in Africa, um, it's really an exciting time. I don't know if you've been to Kenya recently, but I was in Kenya in November, and the, they hate this phrase, so all my friends at Ushahidi are gonna freak out when I say the Silicon Savanna. If you wanna tick them off, say Silicon Savanna. Um, but you, you, are, you are seeing 
what we call in the study of evolution, punctuated equilibrium. Okay, is anyone familiar with punctuated equilibrium? Okay, so Stephen Jay Gould, this paleontologist, also at Harvard, but um, Stephen Jay Gould came up with this idea based on his research that things could evolve much faster than we ever thought they could. And that's called punctuated equilibrium. He studied snails. We're seeing punctuated equilibrium in places like Kenya. And we're all very excited about it, okay? But it's not that simple. So what do I mean? Recent studies have shown that the actual growth of GDP of African countries is causally proportionate to the amount of bandwidth, of internet bandwidth that's publicly available in those countries. That's incredible that we can start to see a relationship between GDP growth and people able to freely access the internet. But the dark side of that is we don't understand what this does to societies. We don't understand what this sudden growth does to power relationships, especially along lines of gender and uh, ethnicity. And we've seen a lot in the humanitarian field, people dumping cell phones and dumping tech solutions into refugee or IDP camps and saying, we want to empower women, so we're going to give women in these contexts a phone. Suddenly, you've made them a target because they are, in some cases, considered property in their own culture. And they have something that men in these contexts do not have. And so you've put a target on their back and the phone's taken. And you actually, in trying to, quote, protect or lift up a population, you've made them vulnerable by not understanding how data and tech work in a cultural context. So we're at this moment where we're experiencing change that we don't know how to actually diagnose it. And looking at the, the issue of just tech and development, okay? Right now, 12% of Africans have a smartphone. In three and a half years, the current prediction from the, I believe, GSMA, the Global um, Mobile Association, is that we're going to be at majority smartphone access in Africa, which is incredible. Thinking, when I used to work in Ethiopia, the whole country of Ethiopia had two or three, at most, T3 lines back in 2004 for the whole country. And now we are looking at possibly a majority smartphone usage in Africa within three and a half years. But we, we can't just keep doing what we're doing, which is measuring the relationship of economic growth in data and tech consumption in our traditional terms. We have to take, as I was talking about this morning, a rights-based approach where we start thinking of information and access to information and data infrastructure no longer as freedom of speech, but as a physical resource, connectivity as a resource the same way we think about food, water, and shelter under international law as a necessity for the sustainment of life. So in terms of international law, we're well equipped. When someone blows up a hospital, we have doctrine for that. That's a violation of the Geneva Convention. When someone blows up a warehouse filled with food, we have doctrine for that. That can be a war crime. But when someone cuts the access to internet of a population they're targeting for genocide, we don't necessarily know what crime that is. In the converse of that, aspirationally, when, <laughs> when the GDP of a country is changing because of access to internet and data, and a certain population is able, for example, women in sub-Saharan Africa, are able to have greater economic opportunity. We don't have a science yet for the causality or determining if there is causality in those relationships and the status of that population. 
not only physical security, but economic security, security culturally within the dynamic of the, their environment. So that's really the challenge of now. So what is this, I'm gonna shut up for a second and just put this at you. What, what does this mean for startups? I think what it means is that we need to move beyond the Gazi, we're hoping somewhere down the line to do charity. We're trying to give back. That's mostly BS. And even if it isn't, I'm suggesting that, that there's an opportunity to do something very revolutionary, <laughs> which is to begin to think about a science of tech design and deployment at the DNA level of how we create startups that has in it a, not only an aspiration, but the beginning of an evidence-based approach <laughs> for trying to understand how access to technology, the adoption of technology and equity in access and adoption of technology can affect the human security <laughs> and human rights status of vulnerable people. And I think that that realizing our responsibilities now is more important, learning how to do that, <laughs> than dreaming of a better world. Understanding what we need to be responsible for with the technologies we're building right now is more important than charity. There's this great line from Jonathan Kozel, the American um, education theorist who I think it was in either Amazing Grace or um, Small Mercies, I forget the name of the book. He said, charity is no substitute for justice. And what we have done with tech so far <laughs> is we have conflated charity with justice in many cases. We cannot expect the problems that we were dealing with before the digital revolution to get better and the new problems we're creating with the digital revolution to be made sense of if we think charity is the solution. It's about equity of data, access, and involving communities in the design. Did any of that make sense? Okay, so what do you all think? I have a lot of other statistics I can spat at you, but I wanna hear your questions. Yeah. very relevant to where I call home. Um, I'm curious what you talk about with the LGBT community this morning and yeah. women having target on their back with cell phones. Um, that's a very kind of outside in approach, top down, we're kind of come in and fix your problems. Yeah. Is there an example of an organization or a project that has actually done a good job engaging the community early on to make sure that that doesn't happen? It, not to pull all my examples from Kenya, but um, uh, CC Niamani, um, which has been using the Ushihidi platform um, in Nairobi to try to do peace building, um, particularly around the recent Kenyan election. Um, they've been very successful. And I think uh, if you look at that group, what is really interesting and where there needs to be research is they did not put the cart in front of the horse. And we're putting the cart in front of the horse all the time, which is, you know, as my colleague John Crowley um, at HHI s says all the time, don't build a solution in search of a problem, okay? We often, in, in social uh, innovation in tech, where we have solutions and then we look for the best problem. Um, in the case of look, using CC Niamani and, and also, um, uh, what, what is it, uh, the Chicago organization that deals with gun violence, similar, and using similar technology. I'm, I apologize to them in the Twitterverse for not remembering their name, but um, Ceasefire, I believe they're called. Those groups are great because they went to a community and said, what is your need in terms of situational awareness, in terms of community building, and then they designed a protocol. Not a, this is a difference, not a tech solution, not an app, but they designed a protocol and approach that uses tech and apps as part of that. We've confused tactics and strategy, okay? We have a social media strategy. No, you have a social media tactic. Twitter is a tactic, it is not a strategy. And 
so that means that you have to have a community-led approach, and that means consultation. But how do you do consultation and consent with some populations where consultation is impossible? For example, the work we did in Satellite Sentinel, um, we could not engage in a community consultation before deployment because it was a non-permissive environment. We couldn't go there without being killed. And so that's one problem. How do you do consultation in environments you can't access? The second is consent. What do we mean by consent? Um, how do you get someone to consent when they are not, oh, they, they don't have a frame of reference yet for what these technologies can do and what their blowback may be? In the old school world of anecdotal human rights reporting, you go in and you speak to the local goat herd and say, when did you see the vehicles come into your town? What uniforms were the guys wearing? And they tell you that and you de-identify the person, right? You're protecting the individual. But now the challenge is demographic liability, which is not one person being picked up on t Twitter, you know, the security service saying, it was that guy? No, it was that entire population of people. So now, with the digital world, we have this huge consent problem, which is we're dealing with demographics that in your reporting, like with the LGBT mapping example, you can pull the roots out <laughs> of an entire community when you have bad actors who don't care who the guy was. Uh, especially in genocidal contexts, they're going to, th their aspiration is to kill everyone. So any information you can give them about which part of the demographic is potentially the, the eyewitness is going to help them. We don't have a way of thinking about that. And it comes down to one last thing. This is a very long-winded response, but we talk a lot about doing no harm when in we engage with these vulnerable populations. We don't have a theory of harm yet. How can you not, not do harm <laughs> when you don't know what causes harm, right? So famous example from my colleague Andrew Zoli's book, Resilience, he talks about the Twitter, the use of Twitter in Mumbai during the t horrible attack on the synagogue. Do you remember that a few years ago? Um, they were able, the perps were able to fire on the position of the special forces snipers that were brought in because they were monitoring Twitter, okay? So the point I'm making here is we don't even have an accepted theory yet about what causes harm. And if we think about the Boston Marathon bombing, we also don't know about the relationship of power to publishing and to not publishing. So in the Boston Marathon example, Boston police said, stop tweeting locations of SWAT teams. And suddenly all the tweets disappear. Okay? But how do we have rules about that data when that SWAT team, in the case of many countries, may be a death squad? How do we develop rules about that and understand the nature of harm? And how do we encode that into our tech? What's your... Unless I've answered all your questions. <laughs> Any other questions? Well, um, um, it's all about, um, you know, having a, a strategic network of people who are connected to the technology and that could be representative of uh, a, s a population, you know. Well, I don't know really how you could uh, improve your da the data collection or the, the way you, you give messages to all those people, but um, it's certain that uh, some apps might, might be of use and may, maybe uh, you could... Uh, I, thought, I thought about the, um, uh, I don't know, the Coke bottles or uh, Coke cans. Everyone has that in, in Africa or everywhere. If you could have some messages inside... <laughs> Or uh, so that they, they know where they can, um, um, well, bring together information and maybe, you know, some, some partnerships to, to make. Well, I, I think uh, you bring up an issue, okay, which is um, we are doing with technology 
some of the worst things that we've done with humanitarian assistance in the past 20 to 30 years, which is assumed because we have a technical um, background that we understand contextual implication. And that should always be avoided. If you think you know what something's going to do, then you're, someone's probably deluded, okay? <laughs> because um, in the case, let's take Satellite Sentinel, for example. Th there was massive communication on the ground amongst populations. The challenge wasn't creating communication. It was about connecting that local communication to the grid in a, at a trusted safe point, um, which we did to some degree um, throughout the project. But the key thing with SSP is this, is that we thought we were going to be observers at the beginning, right? We're taking these satellite images, we're analyzing them, and then we put them out. We're catalysts. That was the idea we had, is that we were having a catalytic effect. We were affecting, but we ourselves were not affected, right? <laughs> but then we began to realize that things were changing as we started putting out this new data. And helicopters that were on the pad the day before we released a report about the helicopter suddenly disappeared from that landing pad and never came back. Um, vehicles appeared to be parked under trees or to be moving at night. Now, we don't know what we did to mutate the behavior of alleged perpetrators, but that's what we have to get to. We have to get to a science of understanding, not predicting consequences of technology deployment on vulnerable populations, but of having a procedure for how we assess and mitigate. And you know, it's the example I use all the time is about um, if in the United States, if you had a club of a, a high school club of uh, students who really hated cancer, right, and they decide to make their own homemade chemo and go out in a van and distribute this chemo at hospitals in the United States, they would be arrested by the FBI and the FDA. <laughs> but instead, we can <laughs> make technological solutions for deployment amongst poor and exploited people, including people who are <laughs> being targeted for an armed conflict, some of the most vulnerable people in the world, and we might win a Nobel Prize. That should be shocking because it is a double standard. We have a double standard in terms of the level of ethics and of institutional review and of identifiable information protection and community consultation that we do with a U.S. deployed product compared to what we would deploy in a much more extreme scenario in a developing country. So to sum my talk up in a, in a sentence, it's that. And none of us should be okay with it. Because we're calling this charity when we put an untested kinetic solution into the most complex operational environment. Here in the United States, we would call it reckless. So that's the challenge of our generation. <laughs> Is, and that's what data equity means, is that we don't deploy a solution in Detroit <laughs> that we wouldn't deploy in Orange County, that we wouldn't ask people in Orange County what they think about deploying that solution when we wouldn't ask them in Detroit or didn't think we needed to. Well, human geography. And we, we, we are beginning to learn about, yeah. In, in the work we do, um, human geography is a key part of our assessment and our protection assessment uh, that, that we do on a population. We understand, you know, everything we can. Um, but we don't have a standard procedure and we don't have evidence for how learning about human geography relates to trying to understand what tech is going to do 
in that environment. So we can know a great deal about the Misaria tribe in Sudan. We can know a great deal about the Dinka and the Nok tribe, but the, the knowing about the Dinka Nok tribe doesn't allow us to predict yet what technology is going to do. We don't have that research yet. Yeah. Can we get this gentleman a mic here? Yes, the internet being you know such a large force of change for you know the whole world and especially in these areas as you talked about like uh, the growth of bandwidth being correlated with the GDP etc. Like, how do you see the potential of like having five different versions of the internet in the next ten years? Like you know having like China censoring their own you know controlling their own internet and you know having potential you know uh, government trying to step into you know controlling that. That, that force of change and censoring it and potentially, you know, reducing the impact of tech as, a, as an ability to change, you know, uh, the development of this area. Well, I, I think it was, I'm going to mess up his first name, it's either Jean or Jacques Brutelier, a famous postmodern theorist from here in Quebec, talked about the power of La Grande Recité, the big story, okay? So the internet is fundamentally a challenge to the way in which governments control big stories. It, as we've seen in Tahrir Square and Arab Spring, the internet allows for <laughs> the um, decentralization of narrative creation and thus for the decentralization of power. <laughs> and so that means that governments who need to control that narrative begin to develop like antibodies to an infection, responses. And they are mu mutating those responses more intentionally, more dedicatedly than we are, and I mean the community of people who care about data freedom, than we are thinking about how to counter them. And it's not about developing the next encryption patch. Okay, so the balkanization of internets to create spaces similar to what's happened with the Great Firewall in China, where you cannot talk about the fact that Tiananmen Square did happen in 1989. Um, that, that's a challenge to now, which is, you know, as Salman Rushdie said, that um, the world is kept afloat on a life, he said in Midnight's Children, on a life raft of stories. It is the multiplicity of stories that saves us. Okay? So that is the promise of the Internet. On its best days, is that it's Rushdie's dream of the multiplicity of stories that may save our lives by that diversity. But the challenge is that how do we maintain that in a way that's not just about activism, but is about the professionalization of the science of that maintenance <laughs> of the independence of narratives. And I think that the key is um, it is about rights. To go back to what I was saying this morning, why does a rights-based approach matter? Because the concrete is hardening, as you bring up very eloquently in your question. <laughs> the concrete is hardening on the physical hardware and infrastructure, and cultural hardware, software, and infrastructures that's going to determine internet freedom. If we don't stake in international law a right not, it's not as simple as freedom of expression. That exists, but we're talking about a right to data and a right to equitable access to data like the right to health. If we don't put it on that level, then we will not have a fighting chance <laughs> in terms of articulating to governments that should be respected. So it goes like this. You articulate the right, then you can articulate the responsibilities of governments. Once you articulate the responsibilities, you can begin to create metrics for realization. So that's our challenge now in terms of tech development. What is the right? What are the responsibilities of governments to realize that right? And how do we measure whether they have? <laughs> that's huge because several years ago, how am I doing on time? Two minutes? Okay. Last point. My, my colleague, um, he was at Harvard School of Public Health long before I got out of high school, but Jonathan Mann, 
who was one of the earliest pioneers in the fight against AIDS. He said famously that health is a human rights problem. Human rights <laughs> is a health problem. Data is a human rights issue. Human rights is a data issue. Making that link and how quickly we make that link and codify it from feelings and thoughts and blog posts into something that exists in the world will help determine the degree of data equity and relatedly data freedom in the 21st century and beyond. So no pressure. Last, last question. Thank you. Um, my question was, how successful have you guys been in terms of articulating this to governments that are a little bit more resistant to providing equitable access to data and internet to their public? Like for example, um, I'm from Ethiopia and um, access to internet is very difficult there and it's very limited to a certain group of people and it's just, you can see the constraints in that country and the government has a huge role that they play in that. So in what ways does your organization, um, I guess Harvard Humanitarian Initiative, collaborate with governments that are resistant? Or do you at all? Um, we don't. Um, what we do is we do independent research. So um, I'm not here to articulate policy, but I am here to say what the research is beginning to show. And we are at the very, right now, we're at the dawn of something. Okay, this is the very beginning. And it should be exciting and scary all at once. Okay, we often think that history ended a while ago, <laughs> but we are in the second, to quote my colleagues at MIT whose book just came out, this is the second machine revolution. This is Gutenberg and industrial revolution, 19th century level stuff, boys and girls. Okay, this, this is as big as it gets. Um, I don't know the answer to your question, um, but we, you deserve one. Thank you. Thank you.